and a very 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 good afternoon everyone thank you for joining us at nssf financial literacy program this is the hour these are the two hours when we take off some minutes in our lives and we say let's go down to the school of money my name is Mboa Apollo and I am always, always grateful and thankful that you are to come over and we discuss money. As we have done previously and done over and over, we remind ourselves that money, everyone is an expert in money. But when we went to school, no one ever trained us how to, to use money. When we went to school, we went to so that we could start earning money and use money. But no one ever tell, gave us those lessons of how do you use that money? How do you get it? How do you keep it? How do you multiply it? And how do you sustain it? So we use these hours, these two hours, to just take back ourselves back into that school of money and we discuss money. I am privileged and glad to be your head teacher for this particular period. So during, during these two hours, I am Sir Headmaster Sir and I will always tell my panelists and moderators here to, call, to refer to me as Sir Headmaster Sir, which is a very, very big post in this school of money. Again, thank you so much for joining us. And today we are talking about health and wealth. One of those two things that we, that we think uh, maybe they are not connected. But today we have distinguished panelists to di to, for us to dive into that topic of health and wealth. Are they connected? Are they exclusive? Do you have to have one or do you need one to have the other? What are those questions about health and wealth? Does money actually have to, have to concern wealth? What are those things? If the live stream team will kind enough, they will show you our slides and I will just take you through the introduction. My job is simple, to just remind ourselves why we do this, why we keep doing this. We've been doing this for the last three years and I will keep doing this. Why? Because there are so many statistics out there. If the live stream team is kind enough to share my slides, there's so many uh, statistics out there we, we keep putting out and telling uh, and, and you all see how they are there how many people get their money and lose it how many people are saving how many people have no option how many people are in their poverty that needs to reverse so we do this so that that is reversed to reverse that particular statistic that short uh, lifespan life cycle of benefits paid that needs to be reversed we do this so that we build a financially empowered and aware membership and nation at well at, 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 at a large why we keep having this school of money is we are building our financial awareness we need to know about this there, there could be someone who has been earning money for the last 10 years earning money monthly and saving nothing monthly why because they're not financially aware that this money at one time is going to stop and they will need to pick from a certain point so we come to you so that you are financially aware and finally so that you have options I've been discussing with some of my members uh, where to, I was talking to, uh, to my panelists and where we, we all agreed that a person without options is a poor man. If your only option is NSSF money, you are poor. You are poor. And we say to that, let's get the options. So ladies and gentlemen, I will keep reminding you of these statistics and I keep sharing them. One alarming statistic, and one not alarming, but one most recent statistic is the 400 billion that was paid over for midterm access. That money needs to count. 400 billion was paid in over in, in one month. Right now we're at about 480 something billion. In one month, 400 billion. That was 10 billion per day leaving NSSF, going to its rightful owners. Who is you? But NSSF asks one and only one question that benefit needs to count. 56% of us, when we get money, we go to a family member, a relative, and ask them, I've gotten some kind of money. What do I do with it? And the advice we receive, not that these people wish us well, but most times misguides us. And that's why only 5% of the population, 5%, this is NSSF members and non-NSSF members, only 5% in retirement are financially independent. That means you worked and you're in retirement and you're not calling anyone to send you sugar. You're not calling anyone to send you salt. You, your, yaka bill is, your yaka meter is not beeping. Your fuel, you are happy with a, with, with a, with a tank. While you were in employment and you were, had a full tank, you are able to afford a half tank when you are in retirement. So ladies and gentlemen, these are why we do this. Why we do this. Health and wealth. Let's connect it a bit. Health does not 
Money does not mean health. I want you to know that. That is one thing we want to agree on. Money does not buy health, but money is spent on health. It is actually important for health. We are also having a background discussion and we're saying, at a certain point, someone will count the amount, how much they are paying for your oxygen if you ever end up in ICU. That is money. That is health. And they will have to take a decision based on money that will affect your health. Should we keep this person breathing at 4 million per day? Or should we keep our 4 million and they go rest? You will hear at some, uh, at, at, at some funerals when people are saying, hey, he has rested. He needs to rest. Because you, they, they want you to rest because you have been of no money importance in their life. Health and money. Health and money. Ladies and gentlemen, wealth is not an indicator of health. But health can limit and drain your wealth. But, well, but health can drain and limit your wealth. Much as, and one of my colleagues here today put on glasses, I will introduce him later on, and everyone... People have never seen him putting on glasses and say, hey, this man has gotten money. He even has glasses. They feel that having a health defect is an indicator of wealth. But the doctors are here to tell us today. But one thing is for sure. Your health can drain your wallet. So we need to talk about health and wealth. Money problems can cause health problems. And the health problems can cause money problems. Ladies and gentlemen, we cannot ignore health and money. Today, that is the subject. So someone will be asking, yes, you are saying we are in a school of money. So are we discussing health? Well, those things should be for from 70s presser when he's doing COVID. No, health and money, we cannot do away. Health and wealth are twins. So ladies and gentlemen, today you can become a salongo, you can become a nalongo, if you can nurture both of these. Earn your place of becoming a salongo and nalongo and have these twins, health and wealth. Ladies and gentlemen, I need to remind you that growing up is optional. Growing old is mandatory. Everyone grows old. You wake up this, every, every day you wake up, you are growing old. But growing up is optional. So, as NSSF we say, all this we do and all we ask, you, well, ask of you is take action. Because we know action changes things. The only thing that we will get paid for attending this is your action. Your action will pay you. So allow me to stop here and then bring in the crew. But before we do that, who are we with on this call today? Who are we? So I'll ask the back office team to please share that poll. Who are we with today? Are we below 20? 20 to 30? 30 to 40? 40 to 50? Or above 50? Are you male? Are you female? Would want to know that and would want to you share this information with the panelists so that they can articulately share with you basing knowing who they are sharing with so in the next in the next three minutes uh, four, four seconds as i count down five three two zero let's have those results and we know who are we my panelists that majority of the people we are dealing with are between 30 and 40. So 44% of the people we have here are between 30 and 40. The next majority, wow, it's a surprise. I mean, I've already bragged that I, I will know these results, but today they are surprising me. 40 and 50. I don't know whether it's the midterm access, but this number has increased. Then, oi, then 20 to 30 at 15%, and above 50 at 13 percent of course the majority wow things are happening today usually the men are we are the majority in these conversations today the majority are the ladies i don't know who we need to blame for this is it dr paul or dr sabrina but we'll find out ladies and gentlemen allow me to invite ian ian joshua Mwesigwa. ian joshua Mwesigwa is a relationship manager in, char in charge of the financial institutions at NSSF. He has seen it all. He manages the financial sector, I mean, and he's the corporate relationship manager. He's a big man. Ian today will lead our discussion. He will tell us more about himself and uh, also 
invite Dr. Sabrina. When you talk about pe PEDS, Dr. Sabrina's name comes up. And when you talk about eating weeds and eating healthy, Dr. Paul comes up. Glad to meet you, doctors. Glad to have you here. Today, the people you are speaking to have taken off two hours of their lives just to listen. How does health connect to money? Ian, please, take it on. Okay. Thank you, Sir Headmaster Sir, for this wonderful time. And um, a special thank you to our panelists who have taken off their time to come and speak to our audience. Um, in early 2020, Uganda, just like the rest of the world, was hit by a global pandemic. This was COVID-19. EPRC at the time projected that the country would face a job loss of about 3. Point, uh, about 3.5 million jobs temporary and about 600,000 permanent. Three years down the road, after the lockdowns, people are coming back, uh, coming back to work. In February of this year, the Ukrainian war happened, Russia-Ukraine happened. Within a short time, the country has seen a surge in the increase of prices. That is from the fuel to the basics, the necessities, food, matoke, tomatoes, name it. The question then comes, how important is money and health in this discussion today? I am privileged to have two distinguished panelists in their field, and I'm going to request um, Dr. Sabrina, who is on my immediate left, to introduce herself and uh, share her life story and how that life story relates to the money discussion that we're going to have today. Dr. Sabrina. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Headmaster Sir, for the invitation. <laughs> And thank you very much, Joshua, for the invitation as well. Now, it's so important that we discuss money and health today. But for me as a doctor, I feel that I have benefited, one, from being a doctor, but also from being a mother of children when I am a doctor. Because I do save a lot of money from not having to take my children to the hospital a lot of times. And the other thing is, I am glad that I am a member of my family and I am a doctor because I'll give the correct information. A lot of times parents spend loads of money running from one clinic to another and not getting the right treatment. And by the time they, you know, go to see a specialist, they've spent lots of money. I like to save money, but also I like to look good. And for me, looking good is so important. Looking good makes me feel good. It shows that I'm healthy. But also we know that health is wealth. And seriously speaking, if you're not healthy, if you're not well, then you're not going to be able to make any money. So I'll stop there from, for now, if that's OK. But I just want you to know that in my own life, I have benefited from my work because I like to live healthy. But also, I have benefited other people from the advice that I give them. Thank you, Dr. Sabrina. Dr. Paul Kasenene, kindly introduce yourself, share your life story, and how it relates to the money conversation that we have today. Uh, good afternoon, uh, listeners, viewers, um, Mr. Head, Mr. Headmaster, Sir, Headmaster, Sir. <laughs> if I got that right. Joshua, my fellow panelist, um, Dr. Sabrina, who, by the way, played a role in me being a doctor. So um, if there's anything you can benefit, just know she did play a role. Um, I'm also a medical doctor, and I'm happy to be here to discuss health and wealth. Uh, many people think of me as a nutritionist um, because I talk a lot about food. So let me tell you a bit about why I do that and a bit of my story, um, as uh, Joshua has asked. So I actually also wanted to be a pediatrician like Dr. Sabrina. Actually, I wanted to be a pediatric heart surgeon. But when I finished medical school, 
I got corrupted by money. So if you're talking about money, let me share that story. So, you know, back in the day, I finished in 2004, 2005. I think medical doctors were earning about 1 million shillings, you know, at the time. So I get this offer to work in a, in a US-based organization called Moju, and they were paying in dollars. And uh, I don't know how much I was earning, but let's say it was in excess of $2,000. So you can imagine, straight out of school, my dream of pediatrics first was put on the side, and I followed the money, isn't it? You're talking about the money. So <coughs> my job required me to sit a lot, and uh, it required me to do to spend a lot of time sitting and eventually I found myself in a situation where I was gaining weight and because of my food choices, which I wasn't thinking about at the time, I wasn't feeling great. About two years into my job, I started getting health issues, mild ones. So I went to see a doctor, I worked with Dr. Wawire Deo, a very good physician. He checked my pressure and it was starting to go up. So at age 28, my blood pressure was 139 over 90 which is borderline high, and uh, my cholesterol actually was very high, was actually quite abnormal. And um, <coughs> I remember him, after a short discussion, he got his notepad and he wrote for me a drug, atovastatin, you know, he said, just try and take this for a while and see, maybe it will bring down your cholesterol. And you know, as doctors, we, we tell patients, and, we, and I'm sure many of you know that, once you start medication, some medications, you need to take them all your life. And that's now going to be a cost all your life. Now, I didn't want to take these drugs. I was 28. Fortunately, um, I came across a doctor in the U.S. who made radical statements, especially that you can actually reverse heart disease and high cholesterol with diet. And so I actually decided to follow this guy's advice. His first advice to me was, do not eat cooked food for seven days. Now, at the time, I thought this guy is crazy, but anyway, eventually he convinced me to do it, and I did do it. Seven days later, my life didn't change, but I began to sleep better. Three months later, my wife told me, honey, you no longer rub your nose every morning. My allergies were better. One year later, my blood pressure was 100 over 60. My Cholesterol was back to normal, and most interestingly was my asthma had disappeared. And I had asthma all my life, but it's been one year and I had no attack. I was very intrigued. So that's when it dawned on me that two things. One, um, you can quickly ruin your life if you're not careful. And you can imagine I was going to be on medication for blood pressure at age 28. Secondly, it also dawned on me that no patient wants to go to a doctor and live with medication, especially if you have to take it all your life. And so I figured we must then help patients understand why they end up at the doctor in the first place and if there's a more natural approach that they can take. Because most of the chronic diseases, most of the things that take us to the doctor, most of the things that take money out of our pocket when you pass the age of about 30 are lifestyle chronic diseases. And so I started my practice in wellness and that's what I do today. I see patients with all kinds of conditions, but at the bottom of what we do is teaching people to live a healthy lifestyle and most importantly, to eat healthy food. Thank you, Josh. Thank you, Dr. Kasenene. My next question is, if a person was to ask either of you, what does the health, uh, what's the definition of health, and who would you define as a healthy individual? Dr. Sabrina, what would you respond? That, that's a very interesting question and a good question. If I were teaching medical students, I would tell them that health is lack of infirmity. And health is lack of infirmity, meaning there's no disease in your emotions, no disease in your physical being, and no disease um, generally. That you're not hot, you're not sick, you feel well. But we know that health is relative. And if you went to a doctor, just like you take your car to a mechanic for servicing, knowing that you've been driving this car, you definitely find that you probably have a problem. A normal 70 kilogram man 
has a body mass index of between 18 and 24. That means if you calculate your weight divided by your height squared, you should be between 16 and 24. But normally between 18 and 24. But some people's weight goes a little bit up and they find themselves at um, overweight level of maybe 25 to 26, the doctor will start to urge you to cut weight like we had Dr. Kasenene say. But the other thing is that if you visited a psychiatrist, I am sure that they would make a diagnosis of each and every one. Either that you're panicky or you have a panic attack or you're emotionally unstable or you have overt mental illness. So really health is, a healthy person, it's a relative thing. And to be healthy means you are sleeping well, to be healthy means you are feeding well, and to be healthy means you're on top of your game. Some people think that when you're broke, you're actually not healthy. And some people will even develop symptoms when they are broke. Like for example, I was talking to a friend of mine this morning and she had no money in her purse and she was panicking already. And that level of panic when you don't have any money can actually make you unhealthy. I also know that people are stressed because of the rising costs of fuel, cost of tomatoes, cost of soap, and that is making people really, really um, snappy and causing a lot of emotional imbalance, and that is not healthy. People need to relax, people need to distress, and if you're not healthy that way, then you would never know that it's not healthy. I also want to say the overt problems that people may get, hypertension, diabetes, um, chronic lung diseases, those people may not even know that they have, and even cancer. I always like to talk about uh, prevention of disease because we know that prevention is better than cure. By the time somebody discovers that A, they have breast cancer or they have cervical cancer, it's a little bit too late. So for me, I usually say that doing a health check is what will tell you you have a clean bill of health. And on my pre-birthday, I usually go and do a test, you know, do a, a health body check, check my weight, ensure that I'm still fitting in my clothes properly. I, I keep a size 12 for my own reasons. But let everyone know that health is a relative thing. Thank you, Dr. Sabrina. Uh, Dr. Kassanen, do you have anything to add? Um, I think she gave a broad definition of health. The only thing I will add or supplement is that, for me, I like to say you're healthy when you enjoy living in your body. Because um, you may, yes, go for a checkup, and you don't have high blood pressure, and that's a good thing. But if you cannot climb to the 10th floor of an SSF building, then you probably are not very healthy. If you wake up and you know, you're know you always tired, and that's what used to happen to me before I changed my lifestyle, you're probably not very healthy. We have many small things that nag us, headaches, you know, gas and bloating in your stomach. You know, you, you're a man, you can't tie your shoelaces because you know, of some you know, abdominal issues, I mean, I have a big belly, or you forget things a lot. You know, you have to enjoy living in your body. You have to feel well, be energetic, you know, have enough energy, sleep well. That's when you can um, actually conclusively say that you're healthy. Because while you do want to go for a health checkup and find that you have no medical issues, you also want to feel good, have good memory, think well, and actually not get many infections. I'll also just add one more thing to supplement on her point, you know, about all these chronic lifestyle diseases. Many times there are no symptoms in early stages. So you can be sitting right now listening to this and you think you're fine. But if you go for a checkup, like she said, you could find that your blood pressure is up. And that's really the point at which you can make an intervention. So you've got to go for a checkup and make sure you're healthy, but you've also got to feel good. And that's when you can, you know, comprehensively say that you're healthy. Thank you. I want to take you back to one of the statements that you made at the start as you're introducing yourself and giving your life story. 
you mentioned the fact that you get out of university and you get a job that's giving you $2,000 and you put on weight. Now, society today in Uganda, it is, um, I, want to, I don't want to call it a well-known fact, but it's a well-known thought that if someone is doing well, they'll put on a little bit of weight, they'll have a small pot belly, um, you know, the shirt stops fitting a little bit. So are you saying these are misconceptions and they and, it's, and they're actually far from the truth of being healthy? Look, we, um, we all know that in African society, for the large part, there's certain, you know, value attached to looking like you have money, you know. I like Dr. Brina saying she likes to look good, and she looks really good because she's not, she's not just saying she wants to look good, but she actually does look good. But some of us want to, you know, be there and have a bit of a pot belly and, you know, you know, even brag that I have diabetes. Because if you have diabetes, then you have a, a rich man's disease. But really, we need to start changing that mindset. You know, um, I, when I, I also wanted to gain weight. You know, when I was at uni, I was this size. I was actually smaller than this. Now I'm 67 kilos. People don't believe that, but I'm actually 67 kilos. I was 59 kilos at uni. Now, when I started working and having a bit of money, doing well, like you said, quickly, I was like in 85 kilos. I remember one of my relatives remarking that now you look like a doctor. <laughs> and now when patients come to see me and they find this guy who is looking small, they're like, are you sure you're the doctor? So there's this perception that if you're going to be a person of affluence, a person of wealth, you need to be bigger. But sadly, we need to change that because those, if you have a big belly, you're high risk for diabetes and for heart attacks and for strokes. So while it does seem like something nice to have, it's actually setting you up for many bigger health risks, which will eventually cause you health problems, which can be a big cause of an issue to your financial health in the long, short, and even medium term. So it's true in Africa we have this misconception, and, it, and I'm sure Dr. Sabrina will say this as well, it doesn't also stop with adults, even our children. You know, you, you, you have um, parents wanting their children to look healthy. And, I'll, and, and I'm not a pig, but I'll just share a quick story. You know, sometimes pa uh, patients, mothers, and I thank God for mothers, and fathers, if you're listening, please also take part in taking the kids to the doctor. A mother will come and say, you know, you're a nutritionist, I want my child, my child is too small, okay? I need you to help me make a plan to help them gain weight. So I'll typically get a growth chart. I said, let's first plot on this chart, or let's see what it should be the expected weight for this child. Many times this child will be normal weight, but compared to the three siblings that they came with, she looks small because the others are ov overtly obese. So this one who is normal is being considered unhealthy. And these who are huge, I mean, with all due respect, who are big, are actually being considered normal. So our society is actually at a certain point evolving to expect or to want to look a certain way to portray health, which unfortunately is not always uh, what should be the, the situation. Okay, thank you for that. Dr. Sabrina, yes, you want to add something? I, I also wanted to add on to this that in the 70s and 80s, there were people called Mafuta Mingi, and they had big abdomens. They were traders, and they were sitting a lot and earning lots of money. But today we know better. We know that if you are considered a mafuta mingi, either you're, you're too lazy or, you, or you're, I didn't want to use the word corrupt, but most likely you're corrupt, and you don't know how to use your money properly, and you're binging on, on a lot of food, and you're not exercising. It's very clear that people who do not exercise, you know, those sit-ups, in the morning, uh, jogging around and eating enough food. If you don't do that, you're definitely going to pile food on your abdomen. I usually tell um, gentlemen, because sometimes I do have talks with both gentlemen and ladies, and I say that if your waistline is more than four times your hip size, it means you are in trouble. It means that you're loading fat on your pancreas, you're likely to develop uh, diabetes, you're likely to develop high blood pressure, and you're at risk of not looking smart. And people want people who are smart. 
I mean, look at my neighbors. They're both very smart in their outfits. If a man cannot tie his, way, his suit, his jacket, then there's a problem. It means he's wearing an undersized jacket. And so it's very important for people to maintain their weight. People have done studies in the US, for example, and they've noted that in areas which are near the university, people keep trim and healthy. Remember the body mass index that I talked about? They maintain a good body mass index. And then people who live away from the university are more poorer and they eat junk food and they are massive. They have, you know, super obese and morbid obesity. But we also want to say that for children who are gaining weight at an early age, that is dangerous. Remember, your skeleton can only sustain a certain amount of weight. And also your heart, your, lit your poor heart, which is the size of your two fists together, it can only pump out blood for a particular amount of body mass. So if your heart is pumping blood and a lot of fat and excess body weight, you're going to develop hypertension. So let us be cautious. Let us not follow the flow that gaining weight, especially after you're married, that it's a good thing. Your spouse wants to see you, how they found you when you were in that prim and proper size. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Sabrina. But relating to that, um, you find so many parents saying, I have got to show my child that I love them. So every time I am going back home, I have to pass by that place that sells uh, fries and chicken, you know, and sausages. And I mean, they've, not, they've got to have a good life. I, I didn't have these things when I was growing up. So are you saying they, they don't love their children or it's the wrong type of love if they are giving them such things? I think loading your child on lots of sausages and over-processed food and junk food, you know, chips which is so oily, is not a healthy thing. If you love your child, you want them to grow up and be your age or even more. You want your child to grow up and live to 100, perhaps. And giving them a lot of junk food is not helping them. So let's take caution. Let us not, let's be wise and let the children exercise, let them sleep enough. But even as you give them treats, maybe once a week, let them understand that it's not the daily. Too much of anything is always bad and we should be careful with how we treat our children. Thank you. Um, Dr. Paul, in your intro, um, introduction remarks, you mentioned something relating to reversing diseases. Now, most people know that if they fall sick, it is medical bills. You've got to go to the hospital, they run the test. And if they, after you've run the test, they give you tablets. But here you are saying there are diseases, I think you mentioned asthma, that could be reversed. How true is this? Okay, so um, I'll start with the, my asthma story. So I always tell people, I wouldn't say that I, I don't want to say that I got cured, but I don't get asthmatic attacks. So that means that my body is in a state where it's able to support me enough not to get frequent asthmatic attacks, not to get any asthmatic attacks at all. So whether I'm cured or not, I don't think is the most important thing. What is important is that you're healthy enough for your body to support you. Now, there are conditions which I believe um, are reversible. And I know this can be controversial. Because sometimes in the educa you know, in our education system and, and, may, and, and a lot of the information we got in the past, some conditions were lifelong. Now, what I have found most surprising is that diabetes type 2, for me, I found is the easiest condition to reverse. And I'm going to tell you why I say that. And this is one of the conditions that is taking a lot of, of, of toll on our people's health. It's, first of all, you have to buy medication all your life. Many times it gets worse to the point where you end up on insulin, which is even an additional cost and burden. Then sometimes you get kidney failure, you need dialysis. So this is one condition that causes a lot of morbidity or a lot of health challenges. I'm a functional medicine uh, specialist. And in functional medicine, 
the goal is to understand what causes people to get the problems that they present with. If I speak of diabetes, for example, if, if you have type 2 diabetes, your body produces insulin, which is the hormone to control blood sugar. But something is resisting insulin from working, so you're not, your body is not able to respond to insulin. Most commonly, fat. Now, if you have high fat around your belly and around your insulin receptors, it's not going to work very well. If you go on a healthy diet and a healthy exercise program and get enough sleep, you can actually get your insulin receptors to work again. And so in that case, you can actually reverse the dysfunction. So I personally prefer to tell people that you have blood sugar dysfunction. At some point, it could be diabetes and it's harder to reverse. But for most, whether it's high blood pressure or high cholesterol or diabetes, you know, many of these conditions can actually revert back to normal if you do the right things. And so it's important for people to know that so that you actually feel empowered that you can do something about this. Because if you feel that I am doomed to a lifetime of medication, sometimes you may feel that there's even no point to make the changes that I need to make. And I'll just add that to um, something that is very fascinating. Many of us, when I, many of my patients, if they come to me, um, they want to lose weight, they want to eat better. But if they have, let's say, high blood pressure or diabetes, one of the things they frequently tell me is who else in their family has diabetes. So you say, Doc, my father has diabetes, my mother, my aunt. You're basically trying to build a case that this thing is not my fault. It runs in the family. It's my turn. Genetics run in the family. Genes are in your family. But genes have to be triggered by lifestyle and environment. So if I have genes for diabetes, and I live a healthy lifestyle, I won't get diabetes. That's why not everyone in the family ends up with these conditions. So we want people to be empowered to understand that even what we call chronic lifestyle diseases, many of them can be reversed. And even if you don't reverse it, it can improve to the point where you're spending so much less on medication and are going to have a less risk of getting complications in the future. Thank you, doctor. Um, my next question was relating to genetics. So you've talked about it, but I'll ask Dr. Sabrina to supplement. Because still, there are so many people that say, I eat a lot because that is who we are as a family. When we gather for parties, we eat a lot, you know? Uh, when it's um, uh, Christmas or Easter, this is how much we eat as a family. We are known to be good eaters. So are you saying that people are using uh, genetics as a clutch? Um, instead of taking personal responsibility for their health? Dr. Sabrina. Uh, I, I'd like to hear about families that eat a lot. To, to for you to say I'm a good eater, I mean, don't be proud of such things. That's also going to be the same statement when people say, oh my God, we are alcoholics. Like, we can drink a tank of beer. That, that shouldn't make you proud at all. I mean, it, it's all behavior. If your grandfather was a um, large-sized individual, it doesn't mean you should take up the same. You can change your behavior and still grow up and be healthy and, and live longer. And I want to say that, yes, people want to live longer. People want to suffer from a disease called longevity. But eating a lot, it's not one of the magical ways. I know people who go for parties and they pile their plates of food like mountains, like as if they are in a competition. That shouldn't happen. And it, it also shows bad behavior, like you're greedy, you're, you're, you're binge eating. It's just bad behavior. It's, it's not good etiquette. And people will judge you from how much food you're eating at a party. Because if you're eating the entire Lusawani of meat, then what about the other people? So it's those behaviors that help you to apportion, you know, eat what you can. Because remember your, your stomach, that sac which carries the food before it's digested, it just takes up to two liters. But it can expand. If you fill it a lot, it can expand to four liters. And the more you eat, the more the food will get converted into fat, and before you know it, you're obese. And we know that Surgeons have had to staple people's stomachs when they are obese um, because they just want to limit the amount of food you're packing into your stomach. 
and prevent you from growing too large. So, no, genetic massive eating, it shouldn't be encouraged. Thank you. Now, in, in May of this year, a headline ran in one of the nation's daily newspapers that read that 14 million Ugandans had a certain type of mental disorder. Now, the interesting thing is that some experts say, because this report, this report had actually been run before the pandemic in 2019, but only came out in 2022, it's quite possible that that number is actually double. So, Dr. Kasenene, isn't stress something that people should just get used to living with? You know, I mean, this morning alone, as we were driving to work, I'm sure you must have noticed the gas prices. I think a liter of uh, diesel petrol, there's almost no difference now. It's, I think it's coming to close to what, 6,000 shillings? So shouldn't people just get used to living with a stress and let life be? Interesting question. So when they were increasing the gas price, I was actually at the pump. And I thought that the guy would forgive me because I was already at the pump and it would go up after. But sadly, it's almost 6,000 a liter. Now, so stress is one of the big things that contributes to many health-related conditions. It's actually, in my opinion, the underlying driver of many of the things. Um, even people who are obese, maybe times they are stress eating. They are eating a lot because they are stressed. You know, they are stressed out, their blood pressure goes up. So we need to understand that stress will have a negative impact on your health. Once you understand that, then the next thing is, what can I do to try and manage the stress? This theory or belief that I can thrive in stress and that I actually, you know, perform better in stress is misguided. Yes, a little bit of stress can be good for you because it drives you on, but too much stress in the long run will harm you. Now, stress is actually not supposed to be a bad thing. The stress response, let me, let me, let me repeat that. Let me, let me rephrase that in case people get lost. Your stress means you as a person have identified a situation as challenging. Then your body responds to that event, okay? There's acute and there's chronic stress. So acute stress, a simple example is we are here, we're having a good conversation and a snake appears from somewhere. Then you don't need anyone to tell you this is stressful. Adrenaline kicks in and we all flee, isn't it? That's a survival response. It's a good thing. If you can't run and flee and, and, you know, and hang on to something, you're probably going to be in danger. So this adrenaline is a good thing. But many years ago, acute stress was actually danger. Your grandfather has gone to hunt. He's trying to throw a spear at your goat, and there's also a lion there. And stress meant war, fighting, bleeding. So if you're going to have acute stress, your adrenaline will prepare you for danger and injury. If I bleed a lot, I'll die. So what happens is when you have acute stress like adrenaline, your, body, your blood starts to prepare you for injury. So it's very high risk for clotting when you have a lot of stress because your body is just waiting for injury and then it clots. But you, there's not injury when someone just calls you and tells you the fuel price went up, isn't it? But it can be acutely stressful. So that process will trigger changes in your body that many years ago would help you survive and now they're going to make it a heart attack because now your blood is going to clot. So if you're not aware of that, you can think you're thriving on stress, but that's why we hear so many people are just collapsing on their desks. Chronic stress produces an, a different chemical, cortisol. Cortisol, again, is like a steroid. Steroid gives you stamina. Athletes, if you want to win a marathon, steroids. But cortisol will switch off your blood sugar control system. It will affect your immune system. And it also affects your reproductive system. Now, you, you know, I once heard this from a professor of mine. He's like, many, many years ago, chronic stress was not traffic jam and prices of fuel. It was war and famine. So that's not the best time for you to have a baby, okay? So your body somehow senses chronic stress and down-regulates the hormones in such a way that, you know, this is not a good time. But that stress never lasted forever. So fertility sort of came back. So stress is, can contribute to infertility. So we need to understand that stress has direct real impacts on our health, short and long term. And so once you understand this, the next question is, what can I do about it? 
that's another story because the, you know sometimes you can't run away from the problem. But just that awareness makes you realize that um, we need to do something about the stress and not just stew ourselves in this problem. Thank you for that. There's a joke that goes around uh, and um, that when people are applying for jobs, on their CVs they always indicate, I work best under pressure and stress. So from what you are saying, I think people should start scrapping that off. But over to Dr. Sabrina. Usually when we talk about stress, it's, it's in light of the adults, you know, the people who are waking up every morning to go to work and look for the money to fend for their families. But as, we've, as research has continued to be done, the stress in children um, also keeps going up. What's causing it? And what are some of the things that should be done? Uh, thank you very much. And I like how um, Dr. Kaselini has talked about stress and the dysregulation of the important hormones. Whereas adrenaline is the flight and fright hom uh, hormone, it makes you quickly think, it gives you a sweaty palm, it makes you, your heart beat really, really fast. There's another hormone called dopamine. And dopamine is the one that calms you down. And dopamine is increased when we do a lot of exercise. When we sleep enough, we increase our dopamine. The more your heart beats many, many times, the more your heart becomes fatigued. And children also suffer from stress. Children in utero, suffer from stress. So if mom is stressed, the baby will be stressed. And how we can tell that a baby is stressed in the mother's womb is that the baby will have a poor growth and will be born really, really tiny. We call those small for gestational age. When a baby is stressed in utero, they may want to come out quicker than they should have come out. So you may end up with a preterm baby. But the stress hormones from a mother can also affect a baby. And then they get dysregulation and will increase on the amount of fat cells in their own bodies. And subsequently, this is a child who's going to be born small, but eventually will develop hypertension and diabetes. So stress can actually happen in utero. But stress can also happen to little children. And many things can stress a child. If you leave a baby in their diaper for a very long time, guess what? That baby is going to be stressed. They'll start crying. They'll be irritable. They will not be able to sleep. But as children grow older, we also see that they are stressed. Children tend to be stressed like this. They will be irritable. They'll refuse to eat. They will throw tantrums. And they will have a terrible night's sleep. Children who are stressed can get nightmares. We've seen children who present with nightmares just because maybe the nanny at home yelled at them or mommy or daddy spanked them and they are so afraid to even go to sleep. They are afraid of the darkness. They are afraid to go home. But I'll talk about teenagers. Teenagers who are stressed tend to look for options to distress. And sometimes that distressing can include abusing drugs, abusing alcohol, are refusing to study well, and stress can end up resulting in depression. And when you mentioned that um, headline, I think it was Cecilia Okoth who wrote that story. She said 14 million Ugandans have mental illness, and everyone was shocked. But the truth is many, many studies have shown repeatedly that one out of every four Ugandans, one out of every 45 million Ugandans has a form of mental illness. And mental illness comes in many, many ways. Um, we have um, post-traumatic -stress, post stress disorder. We have depression. We have acute psychosis. But also things like anxiety neurosis and panic attacks. And all those things are stressors. You see it on our roads even. In the traffic jam, people are going in the wrong direction. I mean, those people are not only stressed, but they are creating stress on other people. And then people cutting people's cars, eh? jumping the line, not keeping lanes. Those people also need to go and get a, a proper health mental checkup, actually. <laughs> so, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this conversation is very interesting because what I hear from Dr. Pukasenene and Dr. Sabrina is that health is literally in our hands. 
you know it's the decisions that we are taking however you are talking about it from the angle of um, you know managing stress eating right if we talk about eating right just pick it out alone are you talking about going on a diet and if it's going on a diet isn't that also something expensive isn't that taking more money out of my pocket and yet you are telling me that I should also be able to save aside and give some to NSSF on the voluntary scheme. How does this work? <laughs> Dr. Kosenene. So um, uh, thanks for that question, very important. You know, um, I just wanted to say, clarify about what you said. That's very, very critical. Our health is determined by our genetics, our environment, and our lifestyle. When I was learning functional medicine, they told us genetics, you have no control. You inherit that from your parents, and it does have an impact on your life. Environment, you have some, some part control, but you know, you maybe not control all the pollution and things like that. But lifestyle, you have full control. And so, and that and your lifestyle controls everything else. Now, when it comes to food and eating healthy, I want to first start by saying that the media has really, I don't want to say politicized this issue, that it's even so complicated to understand these simple things. So I want to try and help it be a little bit simple. And as I, as I talk about this, I want to acknowledge that there are so many different opinions out there. And, you know, I used to wonder if I would find the best answer. But I'll tell you something interesting. One authority says eat a lot of meat. The other one says don't eat meat. The gentleman I told you who mentored me first, Dr. Joel Furman, he now, at back at the time he said eat little meat. Now he says, if possible, don't eat animal foods. The head of our Functional Medicine Institute, Mark Hyman, very senior doctor, says eat meat and in fact eat it, you know, well, often. And I was like, how can two senior doctors say totally different things? The answer is perspective and how you approach things. Now, the simple answer to eating healthy is, one, don't put harmful things into your mouth. Then put useful things into your mouth. And once you get that right, you're on the right path. You don't necessarily have to follow a diet, but you need to understand the principles. I wrote a book called Eat Your Way to Wellness, and it took me a long time because I was struggling to make sense. And I'm going to summarize with you three things that I found can help anybody. The first is 90% of what you eat should be real food unprocessed, unrefined. Eat food the way God made it. Once it has passed through a factory, there's a likelihood that it has lost some nutritional value or the other things that could be harmful. You don't, if you want to know real food, go to the market. No label. You don't need an avocado to have a label for someone to tell you this thing is. But if you go and buy a packet of something, you have to write all these things. So 90% of the time, eat real food. Secondly, when you eat real food, half of this time, let it be from fruits, from vegetables, from nuts, and from seeds. On your plate at lunchtime, you don't have to be a nutritionist. Just ask, what percentage of my plate is vegetables and nuts and seeds? It should be 50%. You know, like Sabrina said, I went for a wedding once, and a person I sat with, the way he served food, I couldn't help it. I said, can I take a picture? He said, yes. I posted it on social media, and it went viral. Now, people would think this is maybe somebody who is lacking food and, you know, came in at the last minute. No, it was someone I sat with. We tend to serve too many carbohydrate-rich foods on our plate. So less of the carbohydrate-rich foods, less meats, and then more vegetables. Lastly, 90% of your diet, <coughs> in my opinion, and scientifically based, should be plant-based. So eat plants most of the time. Animal foods are not bad, but eat them once in a while. In my opinion, twice a week is enough. Saturday and Sunday. That's sufficient. When I was interviewing my mother's aunt, who really helped me in writing my book, she said they ate meat five times a year. Christmas, Easter, and maybe a few times a year. Same with our parents, Sunday. If we just keep that tradition of eating animal foods less, we will be fine. So this can be a whole long discussion, but if people follow these three things, they'll tend to be on the right path. Remember, um, keep it simple. There is no plan that supports everybody. If you want to go on a diet, it's okay, but focus on locally available foods. Keep them natural. 
don't overcook them and you know find the right balance with that you'll probably be on your right track to eating well dr sabrina i want to add something then we will have uh, sahid master sir <laughs> okay uh, thank you very much paul and i just wanted to add on that the time you eat is also relevant that breakfast should be your best meal eat breakfast like a king lunch like a pauper and eat your dinner before 6 p.m i know that in our country a lot of people are in the traffic jam by 6 p.m and they probably eat dinner really late. And no wonder, people have, you know, more huge abdomens than other places, and which is not a good thing. Our Asian brothers and sisters, they are quite trim, and you know, you visit and you can't even buy their clothes because they are like super tiny, trim clothes. And they eat at 6 p.m. Why can't we eat at 6 p.m.? Because we have a hustle, because we have to work extra, but we should make sure we eat our dinner. But eat your dinner at least two hours before you sleep. If you're eating your dinner at midnight, just before you hit your pillow, guess what? You're going to get that fat abdomen, which won't help you. Thank you. Um, sir, headmaster, sir. Thank you so much, <laughs> Ian. Thank you indeed. I am trying to look at these questions here, and I'm trying to pick out which ones. But... There are so many comments coming in and saying it's always nice to listen to these two doctors. I like that doctor, doctor of Twitter. Thank you so much, doctor of Twitter. Thank you so much, doctor Sabrina. Thank you. Why are these people only thanking you? Guys, I am the one who brings these people. I need you to understand that it is me who brings them. So before you thank them, pass through me, then thank them. Please thank the headmaster, then thank them. But doctors, these people are getting uh, uh, are really grateful on the information you are sharing. Uh, someone here wants to 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 uh, Dr. Kasenen is saying that that thing you said about genes. Please say it again. I need to memorize that statement. I think you said something about genes. It has come in like two or three times. Then another one here is talking about. Uh, it's a, it's a comment and he's saying ah he now he he now I now realize that I shouldn't be stressed over the MPs, the ministers, the prime minister that are being led in the opposite direction it is stress that is happening to them i think he sees these people being led uh, in, in those cars you know when we're in german they are all taking the opposite direction it is stress so we are we are praying for them dr kasenene uh kindly share a raw meal diet a starter hmm? kindly share a starter of a raw meal diet for someone who has a gut uh, stroke gas after taking protein foods like beans what should one eat uh, that is coming to you dr kasenene there are quite a number of questions and we may not cover all these i'm just pulling out a few can i have a single meal a day which is heavy does it have an effect on my body this goes to both doctors doctor uh, please talk about mental health and uh, and its role in managing wealth. Uh, I think we will get to you. Uh, just not these. Again, Dr. Kasenene here. There is another one. Hello, admin. Please call me Sahid Master Sir. This is for Dr. Kasenene. These rep there are reports that there are so many vegetables in the Ugandan market saturated with pesticides, which can expose you to cancer. Does he agree with the reports on how how should we deal with it? Um, that is for you, doctor. There, I'm just picking out at random. Is plain yogurt better than sweetened yogurt for a baby? Dr. Sabrina, please advise. Can we also take it as adults? They have added that. Dr. Sabrina and Dr. Kasenen, a wonderful presentation. That is from Suzanne. Uh, so much is taking. Please, Dr. Kasenen. Is it true that taking red wine is very beneficial to our health? And how much? I think I know this person. I know this person. Yes, I was asking. And how much of it is? Can we take? I know they are. Uh, I know. Uh, thank you, boss head. Yes, both headmaster. Now you are talking. Kindly, I have a very stubborn weight. I eat mostly two meals and I drink alcoholic drinks almost every evening, moderately. <laughs> Please advise me. I desperately want to lose weight. There are quite a number of questions, uh, but I want to leave it at that, and I, I, I will ask 
Ian to please allocate these questions the way they should be allocated that that good doctors can start allocating. Let me just say let me just give you one more. Um is it okay to take tea for dinner? This is a good saving mechanism. Take tea for dinner. We have seen recurrent cough flu in school going children. How can we boost our children's immunity on a budget? That is to you, Dr. Chitaka, uh, uh, Sabrina Chitaka. Thank you so much. Over back to you, Ian, and the good doctors here. Thank you, sir, Headmaster, sir. So I think we'll just jump straight into it. Uh, Dr. Paul, uh, genetics. I think someone wanted a recap on genetics. So um, I said a couple of things, but in summary, um, our health is determined by three things, our genes, our environment, and our lifestyle. Genes, no control. Environment, medium control. Lifestyle, full control. However, our lifestyle is the one that triggers your genetics. You know, uh, someone, someone once said that your genes load the gun, lifestyle pulls the, the trigger. So a loaded gun without pulling the trigger is not a problem. So it doesn't matter what genes you've received from your parents or what genes you know, God has given you. Your lifestyle determines how those genes manifest. Thank you. Um, then there's uh, the one of um, having a raw meal diet. <laughs> Talk about that. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> a starter, you know, sometimes I get all these questions. And, you know, it's like it's so complicated. But I'm going to tell you, I, one of the principles in my book, is that half of the food you eat ideally should not be cooked. And um, I'm going to explain how that can be done. Because people say, doctor, how? OK. So I recommend that at breakfast, have fruit. You know, fruit is high in sugar, water, energy. Now, if you want to buy, you're going to be active throughout the day. So f breakfast is a good time to eat fruit. Most fruit is not cooked. So you can have your mango, your banana, your purple. I typically will have fruit and seeds or nuts only for breakfast with a little bit of tea. So that would be your starter meal if you want to say for breakfast. Now, I'm going to chip in and say something that is important. Many of us for breakfast, we eat refined grains and we have a lot of sugar with a lot of unhealthy fat. Refined grains is bread, cereals, like cornflakes, if they are if they are just these random ones, okay, and ma things like mandazi cake, we need to avoid refined grains. Actually, if you want to have a long, healthy life, and you want to not have to spend your money on health when you're older, avoid refined grains. This is bread, wh wheat, refined wheat products. Not all bread, but white bread. Chapati, mandazi, samosa, spaghetti, pizza, cake, biscuits. Why? I'm just going to quickly tell you, because this is important. People always throw stones when you say this. Maize is not unhealthy. Maize is healthy. Wheat is healthy. When you refine maize and you remove the fiber and you make portion, what you're left with is carbohydrate, which will be converted to glucose in the blood, similar to when you take sugar. So refined grains will be actually, in my opinion, worse for you than table sugar because you're going to get millions of molecules. So these are the kinds of things you want to avoid. But eating whole maize, whole grain braise, whole grain bread, millet porridge, these are healthy grains. So you can actually eat grains, but eat them whole. So raw foods, fruit, nut seeds. My lunch is usually going to be a vegetable salad. OK. Will you get satisfied from that? Yes. Put avocado, healthy fats. Get avocado, it's not cooked. Get nuts, if you can eat raw nuts, it will also help you. And a salad, lettuce, cabbage, tomatoes, cucumber. You don't need to get very complicated things. That's already 50% of your day. Then at dinner, at home, we have a principle, always have something uncooked at every meal. Whether it's cucumber slices, or tomato slices, or a banana, or a popo, anything. You can actually have a lot of uncooked food. So for a starter, I would say get cucumber, carrots, and tomato slices and make a nice guacamole. Get some avocado, get some olive oil, some Himalayan salt, and enjoy. <laughs> Thank you. Dr. Sabrina, you want to add something? Uh, I'm of a different school of thought. I love my meat, and I will definitely eat my meat at dinner. I always eat chicken on a daily basis. 
but I exercise. So if you're not exercising and you're eating chicken, that's a problem. I also drink a glass of milk a day because I am a woman. I need my calcium. I need my magnesium. I need my phosphorus. And I need my beautiful skin. So I will drink my milk. Dr. Sabrina, this was directed to you. There's, there's a recurrent cough and flu uh, epidemic in the schools. What's your thought on that? Uh, thank you for that question. And every parent worries when their baby gets a cough and flu. We do know that a lot of children with repeated coughs and flus have asthma. And you had the advice that Dr. Paul Kasenene gave you. Make sure your baby is away from allergens, that your baby is eating more raw food so that they can boost their immunity. But on a more serious note, let us make sure that we get our babies vaccinated. A lot of the coughs and flus are preventable diseases, really. And ensuring that your baby went through all their immunization schedule is useful. Babies are being woken up at 4 in the morning. Every time I'm driving to take my children to school at 6.30, coming to 7, I see tiny little children, age 3 and 4, being taken on school buses. And these children are not sleeping enough. I want to reassure everyone listening in that sleep is the new awake and that getting enough sleep is so important. Getting enough sleep is restful. Getting enough sleep boosts your own immunity, but also giving your child a big hug is also very relevant. A hug a day increases um, oxytocin, it increases dopamine, and it increases immunity. Mothers have always asked me, which multivitamin should I give to my baby? Please be cautious. Some of those multivitamins are laced with antihistamines, and they can end up giving the baby um, lack of concentration and being jittery. So every time you see something that is too good to be true, please leave it alone. We have enough vitamins in our daily food, and that <coughs> can be enough. And sometimes it is just making sure that the baby gets enough rest, and that is good immunity. Dr. Sabrina, don't you think you will have a uh, mutiny in your, in your hands from the parents, most of the older generation? I mean, the stories that you hear is that by 4 a.m. they would be up, they've already taken the cattle to the fields, they're back, they've uh, dug a square mile, you know? And now here you are saying uh, children should be allowed to sleep, you should give them a hug, and yet for them they say we turned out fine. So <laughs> what's your take on that? You know, uh, this is uh, 2022. We are in a different generation. And we want our children to survive. And honestly speaking, we would like that our children survive well. If we went through harsh life, that doesn't mean we should take our children through a similar harsh life. And truly speaking, as we think of it, children are woken up extremely early so that they can go to the so-called best school which is over two hours away. And that's the real problem. I'd like that social development, and if NSSF could participate in this, ensure that there are good schools in every district, in every parish, in every little village, so that children do not have to transfer many, many hours to go to school. And that is what makes them travel for long hours. A child, a child of four years, really, why should they be woken up at three in the morning? Because they have to get to school at seven in the morning. If they are at a nearby school, they can sleep for those 10 hours which they need and then go to school at eight in the morning. Okay. Um, I think this, sh this is also directed to you. Is it okay to take tea for dinner? Depends on the type of tea. There's green tea, there's chamomile tea, but tea alone is not enough for dinner. As you already had, a good meal has at least five colors of food on that plate. Not the color of the plate, but the color of the food. And tea is just probably one color. And we know that tea has, um, it has uh, nicotine and thiamines which are going to increase your stress levels. So taking a cup of tea for dinner is not a wise a piece of advice. Thank you. 
Dr. Kasenine, back to you. Someone asked that you're telling us to eat these cabbages and mangoes and uh, tomatoes, but all these things are sprayed with pesticides. Aren't you just uh, leading us to get cancer? <laughs> What's your say? So that is true, and it's a, a very sad thing because um, a lot of the foods we eat are heavy laden with herbicides and pesticides, many of which can actually go on to cause conditions like autoimmune disease and cancer, even birth defects. Sadly, our regulation in Uganda is not strong enough to ensure that you know, these things are used appropriately because ideally no herbicide or pesticide should touch food within a three weeks period of consumption. So if I'm going to consume something today, the last exposure, and I still think three weeks is too early, is too near, but sometimes you can actually find tomatoes and cabbages fresh with them. So, a couple of things have to be done. First, awareness. People need to be aware these things are harmful. So do you stop eating vegetables? I say no, because everything is exposed to chemicals. Whether it's meat, animals are injected with things. We need to start having responsible cons uh, purchasing of our foods. Um, you need to start looking for organic food. It's not always easy, and we can't discuss it in detail here, but you need to start looking at their sources. We need to start trying to grow our own food. Some of the things which are sprayed heavily, you need to understand the farmer is, is, is doing it for profit. His goal is not to, you know, to give you healthy food, it's to sell food. You can afford to have 80% yield with some of it not getting. So I would encourage people to grow food at home. You can do cherry tomatoes, you can do spinach, you can do cabbages, things which are sprayed. But ultimately what we need is an informed consumer who is aware that we need to eat vegetables, but we also need to make sure that they are healthy. Now, if you find them sprayed, or even if you don't find them sprayed, there are certain things you should do. Wash them thoroughly with water, if you do. Secondly, soak them in water with apple cider vinegar or vinegar and baking soda or sodium bicarbonate. These two compounds tend to be able to neutralize some of the pesticides. Sometimes you may need to peel a food. If you feel like it's been excessively sprayed like a tomato, sometimes you may want to just make sure that you peel it. That may not remove everything, but we've got to start taking measures to ensure that we um, get as healthy food as possible. But I, I would not want to recommend that let's stop eating vegetables because they are sprayed, because ultimately you'll be missing out on something that you can get from them. So thank you. Y yes, Dr. Sabrina. Sorry, I just wanted to say that one tomato is now 800 Ugandan shillings. And Paul, when you say that you you can peel the tomato, I'm wondering <laughs> how, what we shall be left with after <laughs> peeling it. <laughs> That's a good one. Um, still, Dr. Paul. Yes. Someone asked about red wine. Mm -hmm. And there's also another question that... Uh, person who is struggling with weight, but he says he drinks moderately. So I think you could tackle both questions. So alcohol is a very interesting thing. There are a couple of, I, I wrote about this in my book. I, I did a lot of research on it. I have a bias towards red wine because I like red wine. However, the literature is clear. There is no amount of alcohol that can be considered healthy. That's the literature. So you don't miss anything if you don't drink alcohol. So let's not say, okay, one glass of red wine is going to be... But in certain amounts, alcohol may not be very dangerous to you. And these are very small amounts. It's two drinks a day and not more than six in a week. Now, a drink, if it's a beer, is 350 mils. Wine is 150 mils. Spirits is 50 mils. So two shots of whatever you have, and that's the safe limit. And not every day. Three times a week, so no more than six a week. And you can't say today is Friday, I'm going to drink all my six on Friday. No, it's two per day and no more than six a week. Now, when it comes to alcohol, because red wine is made from grapes and the process of fermenting it, red grapes have resveratrol, which is an antioxidant that's very good for your heart. Studies have shown that people who consume red wine in moderation responsibly may get that benefit but we shouldn't promote red wine as a health-producing substance that you must drink to improve your heart health. But you could have a glass of two and get that benefit. Alcohol is so tricky because it's an addictive substance. And if you are high risk for alcohol challenges, whether you have a, uh, alcohol challenges in your family, 
or a stress-related lifestyle or anything, you need to really think that. So I would say, have a glass or two of red wine every now and then. It's not going to kill you. But be careful not to get into alcoholism. Red wine is the best. If you want to know the type, a Pinot Noir or a Malbec uh, are good for that. Alcohol has more calories than carbohydrates. <coughs> so when you're on a diet or on a program and you're drinking alcohol, the alcohol calories you get have to be used by the body. So typically, the body will use those calories, and what you're eating is going to be stored as fat and other things. So it's very easy to, start to not lose weight when you're drinking alcohol, or even to gain weight. And especially if you're drinking the alcohol that is higher in, in carbohydrates, you know, the grains, you know, beer, then you're going to likely get a, a belly fat. But I, I would say that um, it's, it's, I wouldn't blame it on alcohol, but people need to be very conscious about the alcohol consumption and be honest to themselves. Am I drinking moderately? Because if you're not drinking moderately, you're deceiving yourself. You find that you're actually drinking more than you need. In summary, I would say that, look, it's better not to drink alcohol. But if you want a glass or two of red wine, and I know people, I know Christians have quoted the Bible. You know, Paul says a glass of wine is good for digest digestion. That is actually true, but there's many other things to think about. But um, I hope that answers the question. Um, if people need help to lose weight, um, eat well, exercise, drink less alcohol, and you will be on the right path. You can get in touch with us, you can get in touch with me, and I can assist you privately, but it's very hard on this call like, to you know, give you all the, the basics. But you can't exercise your way out of a bad diet. I, just want, I, hope, I hope that can be clear. You can't say, I'm going to work out three hours a week and eat junk, and it will be fine. It's better than not exercising, but please keep the right balance. Yes, Dr. Sabrina. Uh, just because I'm a pediatrician, I'd also like to say that alcohol is a no-no for children below the age of 18. And as we speak about alcohol, we need to understand that chronic alcoholism can actually kill an individual. It can kill marriages. It can kill um, people's stamina. It can also cause depression, and excessive alcohol can lead to cancer of the stomach. So people need to drink alcohol with caution. So you're saying excessive alcohol could affect uh, people when they claim their NSF benefits as well? <laughs> yes? <laughs> okay. Um, thank you, Dr. Paul, because there's something you really clarified when I was happy you mentioned it. Uh, more so, and when you, because you had mentioned people should take about what two drinks, mm. but it's good you clarified it in terms of the uh, the metrics, the real metrics. That because <laughs> I know someone who could easily take a jerry can, a five liter, and say Dr. Paul said a drink. So you know, <laughs> so thank you, um, Dr. Sabrina. Someone asked a question about: Is it okay to have one large meal a day? <laughs> no chigala. <laughs> I've certainly seen people who attend like workshops and they will eat a huge amount of food and they'll say they are eating for that day. That's dangerous. Remember we said that your stomach, that sac that carries the food before it goes into the intestines for digestion, it is not like a sac. It's not a 25 kilogram container. It's a two liter container and you need to take care that you eat enough. It's important that you spread out your meals because you give your body a chance to recover and also for your liver to be able to process the food. The liver is like a factory that actually sieves all the food and, and supports your body to gain all the energy that it needs. But eating a meal a day can also result in you getting intestinal obstruction I know people who have fed on matoke. Matoke is not a bad food, but people who eat it in excess, by the age of 60, they are getting intestinal obstruction because it sits in the sigmoid colon, part of the big intestine, and it causes a huge loop. And then at one point in time, it rotates and causes an obstruction. So eating one big fat meal a day is not advisable. Maybe I can just, I want to just supplement on that. So, just like she said, you know, many people are eating less food because you want to maybe lose weight or you want to, I don't know, for what reason? Maybe to save money. <laughs> that, that too. <laughs> but like she said, you can be, all the food you're eating in this one large meal, 
could have been eaten over the over the whole the course of the day. What I, what I want to mention is that sometimes eating less can be beneficial, not necessarily even in terms of what of, of timing. Like there's something called intermittent fasting, where people will eat within a short window span and then fast more. So some people are doing what we call OMAD, one meal a day. That can be beneficial, provided that meal is healthy. If you are going to do one meal a day, and like you said, you're going to have a plate full of carbohydrates, okay? First of all, you may not get the benefit of the fasting because you'll get all the calories back. Many times there's no fiber, so it could get intestinal obstruction. But it can be useful if you're going to eat a healthy meal. I like to recommend that people should have at least a 12-hour fast each day. Now, that means from your 6 p.m. dinner to 6 a.m., don't eat anything, okay? Maybe only water, so that you give your body a break, okay, from, from, uh, from food. But that 12 hours can actually go all the way to 16 hours. But there's a caveat, it must be comfortable for your body. Never do fasting if it's not comfortable. Because some people are getting into this intermittent fasting craze and like, okay, I'm going to eat one meal a day. But they feel hungry, they'll get digestive issues. So I would say 16 hours a day is allowed. And at first I thought this was tough. But again, I like to reference my mother's aunt, may her soul rest in peace. She told me that growing up, they had dinner, like Dr. Sabina said, 6 p.m. They never had breakfast in the morning early. They went to dig and only had water or a drink and then came back at 10. So that 16 hours gives you time to fast and process food. But when you eat, eat well and eat healthy food. Don't say, I fasted for 16 hours. Now it's time for payback. Now I'm going to just fill my plate. Then you won't get the benefit of the intermittent fasting. Thank you for that. Dr. Sabrina, do you have anything to add? Mm -hmm. oh, okay. Um, maybe the last one. Uh, there was something about plain yogurt. And uh, is it sweet yogurt? Dr. Sabrina, you could say something. Uh, I don't want to sound prescriptive or anything. So if a child prefers the plain yogurt, let them eat the plain yogurt. If they prefer the sweetened yogurt, but just know that too much of anything is not good. The other thing I wanted to say is that sometimes people will tell you all sorts of things. Take this yogurt. It's a marketing gimmick, really. But do what is right. And yogurt alone is not a whole meal. Children also have to eat fruits and veggies, and they also have to eat their healthy other proteins. Um, Dr. Paul? Yes. You, uh, uh, you want to say something? Um, like she said, you know, for me, I'm a health freak. So for me, I'm like, I don't want sweeteners, if you're possible. So I would prefer the unsweetened yogurt. But in my book, I always say there's always 10% allowance for anything you want so that life is not boring. I believe if you go more than 10%, you set yourself up for problems. So, Like my children don't take sugar at home, and they've actually learned to appreciate food without sugar. They, do, they don't miss it. They won't say, oh, this porridge doesn't have sugar. So I think as much as we want not it to be a hard, fast rule, like she said, we must encourage people to do the best possible things as much as possible possible. And um, I'm not a big fan of milk, um, but I think that milk products like yogurt are much better because uh, lactose, many people are lactose intolerant. So when you have yogurt, you get the, the, the lactose is fermented to lactic acid, which is easy for your gut. So I think yogurt for me is one of the things that I think can be a good balance. But always let it be organic. This is, this is my, my thinking that, you know, try and let it be natural as much as possible. And like she said, there's too much marketing out there. You know, lots of pictures and lots of things that can be misleading. But let it be balanced, 90% natural. Okay, thank you. One of the things that has come up a lot in the corporate world is um, mental health and health in general. I think companies are starting to realize that mental health awareness is actually a big thing and it's not something that people should be ashamed of. You, you have been in capacities of uh, employing people. Um, what are some of the things that companies should do 
not just for you know mental health, but to impl put in place safeguards for the health of their employees. Dr. Sabrina, you could go first. And um, I just want to say that I am truly mesmerized by the efforts NSSF has done. It's an exemplary institution. And Mr. Headmaster Sir, thank you for taking us around your floor because we were able to appreciate that in one of the office floors, there was even a dart board that somebody can stand up and actually play darts in the office. That's remarkable. There was a swinging chair, which I thought was fantastic. Is it a love seat or a swinging chair? A swinging chair? <laughs> okay, but anyway, I think that companies and corporate organizations need to take mental health very seriously, including having an in-house counselor and ensuring that people exercise. I know a company that has engaged um, a gym that I work closely with, that they ensure that every single person who works at that company has to exercise at the gym at least three times a week. I think that's remarkable. Because the more you exercise, the more dopamine you're producing. I think it's also intentional for corporate companies to ensure that their staff get a holiday. Some people want to work and work until they shut down. And the other thing is ensuring that people find time to laugh. I usually encourage people to smile because smiling makes you look younger and feel younger. And it actually gives you back a few minutes of your life. So companies should find ways to distress. Companies should find time to, to r get retreats and, and be happy. And it's not all about work. You actually get more work outputs by ensuring that people take a holiday and relax, and even sometimes a mandatory holiday. Thank you. Dr. Paul, I know you employ a number of people. Are there some things that you would like to share with your fellow employers? Yes, so stress affects productivity. We need to be clear about that. And uh, sometimes we as employers need to know how uh, the, what's the emotional state of our employees. Many things can affect you, your, your, make you get stressed. It can be finances, it can be relationship issues, it can be family issues, it can be a loved one is, is sick. And all these things can affect the way you, your stress levels are and your emotional wellness. If you're stressed at the workplace, there's something we call presentism. You're there, but you're not doing anything. And that's, you'd rather be there 30, 60% of the time and doing something. So we have to adopt flexible policies that begin to understand what we can do to help our staff members, you know, when they have stress, stressful situations. Because what begins as a stressful situation ends up being an emotional wellness, then a mental health issue. So you start from I'm stressed, then I'm always anxious, then I'm depressed. And so it's important that people, you know, organizations should be keen on that. And let's do mental health assessments. You know, there's a thin line between, you know, someone being normal and having a mental health issue. And many people do have mental health issues, many, many people. You know, I, 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 I was telling some of my clients that even I struggle sometimes with, you know, being overwhelmed. And, um, and yet people wouldn't think that that's a, a serious issue, but it is an issue. So I think we should raise awareness, avoid stigma, because stigma makes you feel like if I talk out, there's a problem. Let it be known that anyone can have a mental health issue. Let's evaluate for it, and let's have a strategy to how to help people have a counselor, have a referral mechanism, and let's not wait until somebody is, is, is about to really, you know, get very serious health issues to address it. Yes, please. And especially people in the service industry. I work at a, a large national referral hospital at Mulago. I also work in a medical school at Makere. And I do know that when people are stressed, they may end up doing the wrong things. I have seen, for example, people who are taking care of our traffic. And when somebody is stressed, you can tell. And sometimes it helps for us as travelers to, you know, greet those people and smile at them and say thank you. It makes a huge difference in their lives. Thank you, Dr. Sabrina. Now, there's something that kept on coming up, just that I hadn't posed the question to either of you directly. 
that is the issue of physical exercises pe i remember when i, I went to uh, school in uh, secondary i saw pe on the on the what was it the timetable so i thought it was physical ex exercise like we had had in uh, primary school only to find out that it was political education <laughs> but anyway um what is the right way to do physical exercise because when you look at the media if you look at social media uh, physical exercise is lifting weights, is having uh, six packs, it's, uh, you know, doing all these uh, fancy things, it's going to the gym. So, Dr. Sabrina, what is the right way to have physical exercise? So, I, I think that the, the best way is to ensure that you have your cardio for 30 minutes, at least once a day. And cardio means you are moving really quickly, either by skipping or running or taking a very fast walk or being on a treadmill for at least 10 minutes, but a total of 30 minutes. The other thing is do not sit for a long time. I'm actually feeling uncomfortable that we've been sitting here for the last one hour and we haven't stood because sitting is actually not a good thing. Sitting on your butt for a long time is dangerous. And if you're an office, you know, a person working in the office, it's important that you time yourself every 40 minutes. Get up, take a brisk walk, look out of the window. You're fortunate to have a beautiful view here. But I think that it's not good for you to sit continuously for a long time. The other thing is you should get a routine and exercise all your body muscles. If you cannot afford to go to a swimming pool, swimming, I think, is one of the best exercises. You can actually dig in your garden because digging is a, a really good exercise. Our grandparents dug. We are also trying to dig. But exercise your bodies. This business of sitting in one place when you get home and you're sending your child for the remote and sending your child for your own slippers, that shouldn't work. We should get up and exercise and try and park far away from your workplace because it enables you to walk further. And, you know, even after eating, try to exercise. And before you sleep, try to exercise again. But whatever you do, do not sleep immediately after your meal. Thank you. Dr. Kasenene? So, um, you know, health is built on the foundation of movement. Most of our body is muscle, okay? And so we don't realize this, but the way the body evolved was that everything depends on you moving to circulate blood, to circulate nutrients, to circulate things to your brain. That's why, like Dr. Sabrina said, exercise is amazing for stress management because it increases circulation and releases dopamine and all these things. So. We've got to, first of all, understand that we need to exercise. Now, I've had people say, I have no time for exercise. I actually tell people, you're not serious. I, like, I don't have other words to tell you. But, And one of the things that made me begin to appreciate this is even when I knew about diet, I went to a conference in South Africa, and the professor, Professor Tim Knox, stood up and put something on the screen, and it read, people who think they have no time for exercise must prepare time to be sick. So if you think you have no time for exercise, just know that in 10, 15, 20 years, you're going to be sick. It's like the law of gravity. If I throw my phone up, it's going to come down. So people have got to prioritize exercise. Now, the recommendation is, like she said, is 30 minutes a day or three hours a week. If you cannot find three hours out of 168 for exercise, it's not your priority. And you're not serious, by the way, because... I have a, a cardiologist friend, and I won't say his name because <coughs> we, we, we were, we've been cross-referring patients. And we got tired of, you know, sending patients to each other. You know, it has heart disease, you know, go to the cardiologist. You don't, you're overweight, go back to Dr. Kassin, and you know, back and forth. So he's been telling them to exercise, and they don't listen. So you know what he said? One day he devised a, 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 a strategy. So he tells the clients, you know what, I've listened to your heart, and unfortunately, I don't think you have more than two or three months more to live with this kind of heart. But there's a solution. Go to Dr. Kassinene, change your diet and exercise. One day a lady calls me, Friday evening, and I like to go home early. She's like, Doc, I have to see you. I'm like, what's going on? She's like, the doctor told me I'm going to die. 
and I need to see you. And I'm like, what did he, what's wrong? She's like, I have all these things. I'm like, no, you're not going to die. Can I see you tomorrow? She insisted. And I said, maybe if she dies, really, I'll feel terrible. So let me go. 7 p.m. Friday, I leave home. I go see this lady. On our assessment form, we asked, how, how much exercise do you do? At the time, she said, hardly anything. So I said, like Dr. Sabrina, let's make a plan and let's exercise 30 minutes every day. You know what she asked me? <coughs> she asked me, is that enough? I'm like, what do you mean? She's like, the doctor, doctor told me I'm going to die. Now, she was doing nothing, and she had no time for exercise. And they told her she's going to die. Now she wants to exercise for two hours eh? a day. And that's going to be our reality, for sure. If you go to the doctor and he tells you you're going to die, you will start exercising. Not, you will even walk home if you must. So we need to first raise this level of awareness. Let's exercise. And like she said, keep it simple. Don't complicate it. If you have a treadmill, fantastic. But go for a walk, a brisk walk. Walk and let your heart rate go up. Jog if you can jog. Go and swim. But get something that raises your heart rate. That's what we call cardio. Now, there are two other things that are important. <coughs> After age 35, you've got to start strength exercises because your muscle mass starts to reduce and muscles are needed to burn fat and you need it for also many other things. Now, again, you don't have to lift weights. You don't have to go to the gym. If you can, that's fine. But you can do simple things like pushing yourself off the wall. You can do planks. You can do press-ups. You can do sit-ups. These are things that help to build muscle. So everybody should try to do that. By the way, I sometimes tell men and ladies, if you want to know how healthy you are, ideally, you get, if you're a man, you get your age, okay? And you subtract that number from 70. The answer you get is the amount of push-ups you should do at one go. Okay? So if you're 40 years old and you 70 minus 40 is 30, you should be able to do that. For a lady, it's 55 minus your age. Okay? So if it's 55 minus 40, you should do 15. If you can't do that, you're not metabolically fit. So start with one press-up a day if you've never done any. Just one. Then go to two until you reach the number. Now, if you pass 45, you have to stretch. Stretching is so important, especially if you're above 50, 60. Simple things, touch your toes, you know, stretch your shoulders. I would say go on YouTube, you know, look for simple exercises. However, make sure that you are physically able to exercise. Don't listen to this show and you've not exercised for for 20 years, and you say, now I'm going to go and carry weights. You will hurt your back. You will get into all kinds of problems. So start with simple things that will not be an issue. If you want to do more complex exercises, get a personal trainer and make sure that you're doing what is right for you. But if you're not exercising, you're basically setting yourself up for disease. And this is NSSF. And we were talking about money. Really, there is no reason for you to reach 60 years old and start struggling because you didn't make time for exercise. And one of our professors told us, he said, this is a joke. He's like, people realize that exercise is important when they've lost their health. Now you've come to my office and your leg is swollen. And you're like, now I want to exercise. How are you going to exercise when your joint is swollen and your, your feet are swollen? That's the time you first need to heal. So our point is make time for exercise. It's extremely important and it's not complicated. And if you've not exercised, even five, meter, five minutes can work at the beginning and build it up. But please exercise. <coughs> yes, Dr. Sabrina. Um, I thank you very much, Dr. Paul, that exercise is important, but we know that as we grow older, we cannot do things that we did when we were much younger. And also for young people out there, parents who are listening in, let our children understand that exercise is important. The things you do as a teenager, as a child, are things that are going to be behaviorally taken up and you will never forget. I know that I, I was a 100 meter sprinter when I was much younger. I still do the 100 meter sprint. My son is a footballer and he encourages us to play football every Sunday. Sometimes we disappoint him, but I know that when he grows up, he's going to be that footballer or the coach. So. Dr. Sabrina, just relating to that, um, you've seen these memes that uh, 60 years ago, parents were struggling to bring 
the children back inside the houses because they're always playing all over the village. Now, today, it's the opposite. The parents are struggling to get the children out of the houses and go out to play. Why? Because they're watching TV, they're on their smartphones, who are, who are chatting that uh, kids are now asking for the latest iPhone 13 and P4 and P3. What's your say on that? Um, I, I think that uh, digitalization has come and it's here to stay with us. And social media is, is actually um, an adverse event, actually, because as children want to be on Instagram, on TikTok, they want to be content creators, they are spending much more time on their digital apps than ever before. And that is also hurting them. The more they sit and don't exercise, the more they are likely to fall sick in 10 years, as we already mentioned. So we need to practice what we preach. As parents, us who are running around in the 70s and 80s, let us teach our children that exercising is important. Let us not copy them. Let us not be copycats. Let us be the role models who tell the children that actually exercise is good. And set rules in the house that say zero, you know, uh, TV time, zero time on the phone. And find ways of taking the children outside. And do fun things with them. Play football, play games. But also the schools need to ensure that they provide space for exercising. Like you mentioned, physical education is so important. But some schools have overloaded on academics and totally forgotten about school. I mean sports in school. So there needs to be a balance. Thank you. Um, as we wind down, I want to ask this question. I am certain that almost everything you've said, people agree with. But how do I start today? I am 55. Um, possibly I'm getting my NSSF next month. How do I start to get on this uh, diet thing that you've talked about? Eating well, eating nutritiously, um, working out. Dr. Paul Kasenini. How should, what are the baby steps that people can do? So I, my advice would be, depending on where you are, there are three A's. First, awareness. Second, action. Third, accountability. First of all, go find out how healthy you are. Don't take it for granted. Go for a complete medical checkup, and it doesn't have to be expensive. You can do the basics, blood pressure, blood sugar, BMI, and a few other things based on the advice of your doctor. That will give you some basis upon which, you know, to know what to do. Especially make sure that you're physically fit for exercise. Secondly, set simple goals. You know, sometimes we think of health and we think of it as something very complicated that I have to go and, you know, pay for a program. No. From what we've discussed here, you just have to pick three or four things, you know, and start with those and, uh, and run with them. I like to tell people, if you want to be healthy, start with drinking more water getting a bit more exercise into your diet, taking less sugar and getting more sleep, okay? And then after every week, add a little bit more because that way you will not feel overwhelmed. If anything is overwhelming, you can only do so much. The good news is that the body has an amazing capacity to restore. So it doesn't take long for you to realize the benefits of what you're doing. Within three days, you can start to see an impact. And within three months, most people literally have a brand new, not a brand new body, but you've changed most of your cells, so you're actually in a good space. So what you need to do is to make the, 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 the decision and then start. And then lastly, accountability. Accountability is so important. Who is this person that, I, that holds me accountable that every week I have to say, look, this is what I did? Because sometimes only 10% of the people are, are self-motivated to a degree where they can you know, get up and do stuff. Sometimes having that person who you go on this journey with is very important. So if you're here and you say, okay, I want to start, get three of your friends like-minded who want to go on the same journey with you, then get another person who will hold you accountable, whether it's your fitness trainer or somebody, and then just start. <coughs> Keep it simple and start. If you fall down, get up and continue. Everybody learns from their mistakes. Don't try and be a perfectionist. That you know what, I have to 
get six weeks, I have to first take leave, then I'm going to start this program. It's very unlikely that even in your leave you will actually have all this time. So create the awareness, know what to do, take action and get someone to support you. And there's lots of resources now out there that people can tap into. But it's important to just get started. Thank you. Dr. Sabrina? Uh, talking about resources, I think it's important to always plan for a rainy day. People are so anxious to get their terminal benefits, but they don't plan for their health. It's important to know that as you grow older, you're more likely to get into uh, complications of your health. And so it's important to save for your health. So even if you're doing all these uh, behavioral change things and um, modifying your lifestyle, it's always important to also consider that when you fall sick, people are going to struggle to take care of you. And you want to have some money on the side that will take care of your health. And health is wealth, like I've always said, but start. Like Dr. Paul has said, awareness, action, and then accountability. Surround yourself with people who support you. And don't think you can lose weight, for example, in one week. That is unhealthy. You can lose weight over a period of six months to one year. And every step of success matters. Celebrate yourself. Have some self-love. And the other thing is um, smile often. For every time you're successful, smile to yourself and smile to other people. Thank you, Dr. Sabrina. I see Sahid Master Sai is smiling. I think he's already putting into practice the advice we've received. Over yes, to yes, you. yes. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much, Joshua. I, I need to practice that one of smile more. <laughs> I, I mean, I need it. Thank you so much, lady and gentlemen. Thank you so much. But before we go out, well, I, I thought we just needed to dive a little bit into this budget. Because... Uh, every time people was, uh, every time a doctor was, uh, any of the doctors were speaking, people were looking at their budget and saying, Yee, how am I going to feed watermelon, what, uh, banana in all this? They, they were thinking, how do I feed? So I want us to just take, uh, and let's, let, let's, let's have this discussion together. Uh, I, I know there is no straight answer, but I have my budget of lunch is 10K, 10,000 shillings every day, and I want to eat healthy. I want to save money i want to save health but let's break it down I, I will start with you let's 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 build up on this plate of 10k uh, joshua any contributions but you 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 can be exempt but if you have any contributions please add them here then we go to the professionals 10k we need to squeeze in the inflation has hit and we are talking about money we are talking about health we need to achieve both of them so how can we op optimize let's build this plate 10,000. yes I think without any further ado, the two mm. doctors should talk about this. <laughs> yes, uh, and, and you will guide them on the pricing because they could be saying this without knowing the price. Okay. I also don't know the prices, but we have some ladies in that. They will, they will hinder us when we are, we are going away from the price. Yes, so 10,000. Let's build this plate. Um, so I, I told you that I usually have eat breakfast like a queen, have lunch like a pauper, and eat breakfast like a, eat my dinner like a princess. So my lunch, which personally I eat, is a glass of water, a glass of milk, if I can afford it. So glass of water, I can boil it. I have a kettle in my office. So that I'm not paying for. The university is mm -hmm. paying for it. Then I'll buy a piece of chicken. I usually like to eat my piece of chicken, and it's 7K well roasted without a skin or with a skin and then my glass of milk that's 10k that's 10k mm. so you we have milk i think a liter is uh, 2000 i don't know don't hold me accountable i don't run the budget at home but i know uh, water is free mm -hmm. if you are living in these government facilities make sure you drink as much water so that you don't even have to get it off your bills and then chicken, I mean, this is a, a chicken, eh? chicken and milk, yeah. and it's under 10K. Yeah. So it's actually... Protein, only pro protein for me. Oh, oh yeah. and you're you are achieving it in a budget. Of ten, less than 10K. Less than 10K. Mm -hmm. Dr. Kasenene, you have, you have a following, but you also there are people wanting to beat you up. <laughs> because when you, some names, 
sound expensive. Just by saying the name, we already am thinking this expensive something. Can we fit something in 10,000? Let's try. So the expensive things are what, like broccoli and stuff? Uh, those things, I, <laughs> I mean. Anyway, for 10K, look, first of all, um, you, it's only going to be expensive if you're eating out of home. Okay, mm. or if you don't pack food, or if you don't eat at the workplace. But 10K, you can, okay. So for me, my source will be beans, peas, or groundnut. And um, unfortunately, if you, you're going to go out and eat, I, I would have beans, peas, or groundnut. I'll have either sweet potato, or pumpkin, or matoke, either. And then I'll have my vegetables, dodo, sukumawiki, spinach. Now. No, I'm just saying, oh, these are options, not, not that you have to eat all this stuff. And I eat my animal foods on the weekend. So, your question is hard to answer because you d at lunchtime you don't go to the market and you buy food and stuff like that. But my thinking is that if you, if, if you go for any buffet, it's going to be above 10K. If you go to the market, that's where you probably will get a meal um, below 10K. But for me, Looking at 10K, okay, I think that if I go to the market to buy food, and I'm going to make it simpler, I'm not going to say 10K per day, I'm going to say 70K per week, okay? I can buy my beans. I don't know if you know how to cook. I, I'll, I will try. <laughs> go on, go on. I can buy my beans, my peas, or my groundnuts. I can eat my matoke, okay? Half a bunch, because now it's, it's very expensive. I can get some sweet potato, I can get Museveni's cassava, I can get some, you know, some minute, and then I can have my vegetables, a lot of them. Cabbage, sukumawiki, dondo. That's where I'll get it from. You will find that it's actually more than enough to take you throughout the week. The challenges are on a day-to-day -day basis. That's where you get challenges, when you're at the workplace and you're hungry and you didn't plan. That's where it becomes a challenge. But to anyone who is listening, healthy food is not expensive, okay? It's actually very affordable. Sometimes I like to buy these small bananas, eh? The kawalaga. You can get it for 2K, and you get like 10 things, 10 fingers. That's what they are called. I don't know if that's the right word. And you know, you can eat that over three days, okay? So if you look at, don't know, in my, at my father's farm is a weed. You know, it just grows wildly. If you look at uh, plant-based protein, it's not very expensive. If you look at vegetables, unless you're buying the fancy ones like broccoli, which I talk about, mm. it's not very expensive. And then keep your animal foods for the weekend. Look, it's actually healthier to eat. Dr. Sabrina can afford chicken every day. But um, <laughs> it's only 6K. It's only 6K. But for me, I believe we don't eat too much animal food. And uh, if I, I would say eat your animal foods on the weekend. Sunday lunchtime, Saturday when you go for a party. And then think about packing your food. That would be my big advice to people who want to eat healthy and also um, not, not be too expensive. Pack your food, you know. And like she said, if your lunch is not going to be too heavy, let it be a salad. Because a salad is something you can actually pack and it stays fresh. It can be your cabbage, tomatoes, cucumber, avocados, and, and the like. So that would be my, my take on that issue. Thank you so much. What I get here is the best thing is, actually, and this saves you money, is, Cook your food. Or don't even cook, because even raw food, you're adding more value. I mean, how fancy would it be that you spend 10K and you don't have to cook that food, and then you can, uh, you can pack it and eat it at work? So that is sorted. Indeed, what I get is it's not as expensive as we make it seem to stay healthy. And it becomes less expensive for us on our own medical bills, because we have decided to, take to, 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 to stay healthy. Ladies and gentlemen, I think let's, let's, let's go into action. I always say action changes things. Let's go into action. We are now aware, but let's get into action. I don't know who's going to hold you accountable, what you need to be. But as we, before we go, one more uh, bit homework from the head teacher. What is that one book that you'd want someone to read? That one book. I'll start with, uh, I'll start with Joshua. That one book. Does this relate to health? And no. Mm. That one book that you feel is homework for this. Anyone, anything. It, it could be on any topic and you could tell us why. Okay, there's, a, there's one called The Psychology of Money. I'm forgetting the author, but it's a good book. The Psychology of Money. And yes. why? 
it really talks about how to handle money, be you know your behavior around money and investments and all that. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Paul. Sir, headmaster, sir. I'm going to ask to break your rule. I'm going to recommend three books. <laughs> Please go ahead. Number one, The Richest Man in Babylon. Anybody who wants to know in simple terms how to become wealthy without complex things, The Richest Man in Babylon. Simple steps on how to save. Secondly, The Seven Habits of Highly Successful People by Steve Covey. A must read. It will give you the tips on how to plan, set goals, and things. Lastly, my own book, Eat Your Way to Wellness. If you want to know how to eat healthy, I explain everything, why, what, when, and I give natural and local examples. I'm not just trying to promote my book, but I think it can be very beneficial if you want to make this journey to a healthy lifestyle. Eat Your Way to Wellness. And we, 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 we are in agreement that wellness will be both financial and healthy. Dr. Sabrina. I wish Paul hadn't stolen my book, <laughs> The Seven Habits of uh, Successful People. But also I'd like people to read the book I wrote. It's called um, The Real Pursuit of Excellence, a simple way to show that you can be excellent without being overly assertive, that every single step matters, and it starts with that one step. Like we were saying, it's always about awareness, awareness that each of us can be successful but also be actionable, that every action matters. An action in the right direction moves you a thousand steps. So please read The Real Pursuit of Excellence. Thank you so much, Dr. Sabrina. Thank you so much, Dr. Paul. Thank you so much, not Dr. Ian. We've had Dr. Ian Clark sitting that seat, but today it's, do it's not Dr. Ian Mwesigwa. Thank you so much for uh, honoring this invitation, and thank you so much for sharing. I think... It goes without saying, we have hosted the doctors, we've hosted authors. Then we've hosted another man, Ian. Yeah. <laughs> not an author, not a doctor, but has really, really delivered on moderating this conversation. Health and wealth, you cannot, you cannot separate them. Become a salongo, become a nalongo, give birth to health and wealth. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to stop here. Thank you so much for always turning in in class. Your oral call has been taken. Good attendance. Thank you so much. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Paul. Thank you so much, Dr. Uh, Sabrina. I think Dr. Paul has one more thing before we close. And thank you so much, Ian. But Dr. Paul, your last word. Yes, so uh, one of the things that I think is very critical is proper health care. Two things. Number one, if you feel sick, go to the doctor. Don't wait until a problem has been there for six months because that's when you find advanced cancer. The things that will make us poor are chronic diseases that can be picked up early. Any symptom you get, go for checkup. Also, before you're 50, get medical insurance. I don't know if NSSF has something in that line. If you're not in the corporate world, get medical insurance because medical insurance will help you when you're older. When you're above 65 and you get sick, you can't get medical insurance. So get it early so that we take care of our health and it doesn't become a burden to us and we end up selling all our wealth to get back our health. Definitely, definitely. And as NSSF, if I have, I've seen people asking here, if I have high blood pressure, can I get high bl bl blood pressure and I access my benefits on medical grounds? No, you cannot. So we are saying stay healthy. We want to receive you at 55 healthy and you actually start wondering, do I need to take this money or I have some energy to work. Being wealthy is about creating options and those options will stretch from financial options, your health options. You do not have to have only one option. Please and please and please. NSSF, as Dr. Uh, Dr. Paul has asked, we are working on, a, on something to do with health insurance, but that will be uh, available to you as and when. Now that the law is in place, we can do these things. Please that does not give you the, 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 the license to be reckless with your life. Take charge, take charge, and action changes things. Ladies and gentlemen, we wrap it up from here. And thank you so much, the doctors and Ian. Thank you.